I want to introduce our first international, uh, our first speaker today, who's the uh, uh, <laughs> managing partner at Newport Consulting, Paul Demartini, and he's a worldwide expert on distributed energy systems um, and the business and policy and technology behind that. He also, I was just having a chat this morning, he also spent four years working under Donald Trump at the Department of Energy. So he's kind of like the Dr. Anthony Fauci of, <laughs> of electricity. I think, um, and he's probably more than happy to chat about that today in terms of the, <laughs> the conflict and the, you know, trying to, to get through in a divided society about how to make good policy and good choices. Um, and we're very lucky to have him today. So please um, welcome Paul to Martini. Thank you. Good morning. Appreciate the opportunity to be here and share a few thoughts about how we're trying to address some of the same issues that you were discussing yesterday as we think about a more consumer-centric uh, power system in the US. One of the things that I've been working on is looking at how we think about integrating the planning that has traditionally in the US been separate between resource planning, transmission planning, and distribution planning, and of course, how we think about engaging customers. So the four tracks and how do we converge those into a holistic way of thinking about what we need to do to advance the power system towards the decarbonization objectives, uh, both from climate mitigation, but also the climate adaptation, which has increasingly been uh, at the forefront in the US, as uh, I know you all have been facing as well. Um, we certainly have uh, in the US and many states, and I'll, I'll touch on that. We all start uh, from kind of the same point uh, in, in the US, and I'm sure uh, not too different for yourselves, where we think about a customer orientation, thinking about affordability and equity, and then as we think about planning, service quality and reliability, uh, operational efficiency, uh, how we think about consumers' energy resources, their rooftop solar, their, the battery systems that are increasingly being deployed, uh, the smart thermostats, uh, other, other devices that may be able to provide some, uh, some shape uh, to their energy consumption, uh, as well as electric vehicles that are increasingly coming into uh, into the market and into people's homes and businesses. And then of course, how we think about operational efficiency overall as we try to address, address this. The, the challenge is that we come from different perspectives as we think about this, uh, this need. So while we may have the common goal uh, and the com com common focus, um, our perspectives really do shape how we think about the role of the customer in that mix. Uh, at the lower uh, corner, if you see that diagram, it really takes the traditional view where the system, more from a central planning standpoint, looks at the consumer as kind of at the end state and not really at the center of the activity. Rather, what can we do to uh, shape the customer to fit the utility? My son jokes, uh, borrowing the John F. Kennedy phrase, uh, ask not what uh, your utility can do for you, but rather what you can do for your utility. Uh, <laughs> And you know, so the, the converse is obviously, as was discussed here uh, and, and a lot yesterday, is how do we put the customer at the, uh, at the forefront in shaping how we think about uh, what the system is, what the regu regulation needs to do, what the, what the competitive service providers need to provide. So how do, we, how do we reshape this in a way that makes sense uh, for consumers? Because that's the only sustainable model uh, as we can see it. One of the things that's happening in the US is a pretty extensive expansion in how we think about uh, the number of, uh, and the diversity uh, of suppliers uh, uh, interacting with customers, uh, what that means in terms of how those other entities participating in the, in the markets and new markets that are developing for flexibility services in the US. Obviously, we have many more uh, resources that consumers are adopting, as I was mentioning. Uh, so we have a whole landscape there uh, that's increasing. Often I'm asked, well, you don't really have competitive uh, retail choice in the US in too many places, and that's true as we think about sort of old school uh, electricity supply as a supplier that's you know, kind of been around for 20 plus years. Um, but we, you know, uh, with rooftop solar, battery providers, sometimes separate entities, uh, EV providers, electric vehicle providers, yet another entity, smart thermostat providers, yet another entity, each of these in the US are all pursuing uh, development of their own flexibility services provisions, and those are completely separate uh, in most cases from what the retail energy provider might be providing. Uh, 
So for example, in my house in, in California, I have rooftop solar uh, provided by one entity. I have a smart thermostat from another ent entity. I'm looking to get an electric vehicle. Each one of those has a flexibility services offering uh, that's different, uh, wanting to control those devices. So one of the things obviously we look at is how are we increasingly going to manage through this landscape, uh, many of which are not part of the normal sort of regulatory schema uh, at, at the retail level, and how do we plan accordingly, uh, recognizing that consumers are going to be using these devices, you know, myself included, um, and what in, in a, is my behavior or my uh, interest going to be factored into how we plan for the system going forward. And obviously that gets quite complex when you start to look at say a 10 year forecast or a 15 year forecast uh, that shapes how we think about investments. The other thing, and this was touched on briefly uh, yesterday morning, but I wanted to highlight this because uh, I think it's really important. Uh, this is something I've been trying to bring to the attention of a number of state regulators in the US, and that is we've got a pretty big difference in clock speed or the innovation cycles that happen between consumer products, which tend to operate sort of on about a two-year cycle for product, new product development uh, uh, in that space. And when you think about a regulatory process, say uh, getting uh, rate approvals for uh, uh, investment cycles, I guess here you have about a five-year cycle for distribution uh, investment approval. So you can imagine if you've got a five-year cycle in the US sometimes for new rate designs or tariff designs that can take up to seven years, you could have essentially two to three innovation cycles that happen by the time that, that what was submitted gets approved uh, or between the different investment cycles. And that has really a, uh, the effect of uh, constantly being lagging where the consumer is, in effect, or where the products are coming into the market. I'll give you a good example. We were all thinking about vehicle to grid in the US uh, and then Ford announces the, uh, the big pickup truck, their new Lightning, uh, which has vehicle to home. And, and that battery for long range has 110, I think it's 110 kilowatt hours, which is the equivalent of about eight Tesla Powerwalls. So that picture we saw yesterday in that video of the Powerwall, that there are eight of those in that truck. So uh, you can imagine that this just changes the game in terms of how we think about what that means, uh, the planning for it and so on. The other is a lot of the tariff designs in the US around these time of use rates where you're trying to shift consumer use to a different time period, um, those were based on the charging for batteries that were a lot less range where maybe you only had 100 or 200 mile range. Now that if you're getting up to closer to towards the 300 with these much larger batteries that are starting at the 90, you know, 80, 90 kilowatt hour, um, that can take you up to 10 hours on a, on a what we call level two charging in the US. Uh, that's a 50 amp and whole new, you know, panel typically upgrade. Uh, so the largest you can get in a home and it still takes up to 10 hours. So a lot of those time of use rates no longer apply. And pretty much overnight, just because of the product innovation cycle, seven years of working on a time of use rate for electric vehicles is pretty much kind of out the window. So this is the kind of challenge we have is we're constantly chasing where innovation's going. And how do you factor that into your long range planning when there's a, a great amount of uncertainty about how to, to think about that? One of the other things that's happening, and I know this was talked about yesterday as well, but when you start to think about where traditional planning and the, particularly at distribution, the number of inputs, uh, if we went back 10 or 15 years ago, it was pretty, pretty minimal. We thought about load growth uh, through, you know, uh, through population increases or you know, new housing, new business starts and the like, and it was fairly predictable. We knew based on weather patterns uh, pretty, pretty well what the load shapes might look like and so on. That's all really changed pretty dramatically. Uh, there's a lot of little detail here, but you know, obviously as we start to think about many of the consumer energy resources that are being adopted, uh, and in the US a lot of it's at the state level through policies uh, and some of the federal tax credit uh, policies that are driving it, uh, and certainly as, as prices have gone up uh, at retail electricity, adoption has increased pretty dramatically in quite a few states now. And, and so that's become a pretty significant input, largely as I'll touch on in a, in a few moments, because increasingly states are looking at uh, consumer resources as a major supply um, option uh, because they're not getting transmission built, they're not getting the big renewable projects built on time. Many of those take 10, 15 years, and we have a number of states with 20, 30 targets for uh, 
decarbonization that won't be met unless you start to tap into the consumer energy resources. So there's a lot of discussion about not just, you know, have the consumer use it for themselves and no export, but actually um, uh, explicitly looking to create new tariffs and structures for export energy and as we pair it with batteries, start to use that as dispatchable in a way. Still early days, um, Hawaii is probably at the forefront of that, California is kind of coming next, but we'll see more states, um, I think, evolving in that direction given the targets that they've set for themselves and the fact that we're just not going to get the transmission built. Uh, there's just way too many political issues around that in the U.S. in most places. Um, we also have um, in the U.S., and it sounds like here as well, um, pretty strong efforts at the community level, uh, towns and cities and county level, around sustainability targets. And that's been ongoing for some time. But those, those action plans that they had developed are starting to come into play. And nearly all of them have some impact on how we use the, the distribution network. And so therefore, there's a need to really engage at that level uh, to think about that. The other is most of them uh, over the last decade have had to uh, and, and wanted to develop resiliency plans. So there was an effort um, uh, that was looking at, I forget which foundation, um, sponsor, uh, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation had the 100 Resilient uh, Cities Initiative, and I know that was worldwide as well. But in the U.S. it got really picked up and many counties and towns um, developed those plans. And in many cases now, because of some of the issues we've been having, like in California with the wildfires and the like, um, that um, they're mandated to do these uh, resiliency plans. Again, these have implications because in many cases they're looking at backup uh, power resources and supplies and looking at microgrids as part of the solution, uh, some of which are looking at community microgrids where you're using part of the distribution network to connect the loads in, uh, to island off and be able to provide uh, 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 reliable power during those, uh, th during those events. This is changing how we think about the, the architecture of the grid as well. The last area, as I said, is the threat assessments that increasingly have to be thought about uh, from climate and so on, whether we're talking about flooding, whether we're talking about wildfires, whether we're talking about uh, other events that uh, I'll touch on here in a second. But all of this are key inputs into this process. I'll talk about this a little bit later on the panel, but it's really important, increasingly a recognition of stakeholder engagement. And in the past, we talked about stakeholders, and, and, and we talked about that a lot, but mostly it was the technology providers that were at the table so the solar providers or the battery providers or the like, uh, increasingly uh, what's been coming to the fore, we have community uh, advocates, um, uh, advocates for consumers uh, at the local level participating. Uh, and it's creating an interesting uh, dynamic because those folks, although they've been active on policy matters at say the state or a city level, haven't really been involved in the regulatory process. So. Uh, there's a lot of uh, dialogue that has to happen where we can reach kind of common ground and common language about how we engage on these topics. Um, but it's, it's a great development, and we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, on the, on the panel. Um, just to highlight, uh, this is, you know, obviously yourselves are, are at the forefront worldwide in terms of rooftop solar adoption. Uh, but in the U.S., we have several states that are not far behind. Uh, obviously, Hawaii is a very small system. They're already at 50% of uh, single-family homes and dealing with many of these issues. Uh, so they're kind of the canary in the coal mine for the rest of the U.S. California is not far behind, though, and especially with EV adoption growing. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, like in California, by, by about 2040 in the California, uh, Southern California Edison's uh, pathway to 2045 uh, decarbonization strategy, they're anticipating over 40% other resources or capacity in the state is going to, not just their service territory, but the whole state uh, will be coming from consumer energy resources. So that's a completely different paradigm than we've had in the past where it was largely large scale resources. Uh, we didn't really think about resources at the edge. Those were considered sort of net load uh, and the, the California independent system operator, similar to your uh, AMO, was uh, you know, just concerned with the large bulk system. So this is quite a different dynamic uh, that we're starting to uh, develop in, uh, in uh, California and actually some other states as well. The other thing that's happening with, uh, with temperature rise is it's having a pretty dramatic impact on, um, the, on consumer uh, energy consumption, as you can imagine. And that's having an effect uh, that we hadn't really seen before in two ways. One, obviously, there's an increase overall. Um, but 
uh, we're seeing a, a, a reshape in the load profiles for consumers. So in some parts of the country, uh, like in the Pacific Northwest or in New England, uh, we're actually starting to see some shifts where we may move from a winter peak to a summer peak uh, or a dual peak. And that's having a pretty big impact on how we think about resource mixes and how that's going to get supported uh, in, uh, in those areas. It also has implications for things like maintenance on systems because the normal times you might do maintenance are no longer uh, the right times to do it. So there's a lot of issues there. The other is um, as ambient temperatures rise, um, it has a pretty big impact on the, uh, the ability for the distribution wires to carry that, that power uh, across that system. And, um, and we have basically 50% of our distribution systems in the U.S. are overhead lines. So it has a pretty big impact when we start to think about uh, integrating consumer uh, energy resources uh, and hosting capacity kind of issues and, and the like. So it's, it's something that we're trying to get a better handle on is what's this going to look like over the next decade or so. The other thing, um, as I mentioned, flexibility services are at the forefront in, in the U.S. trying to think about how we mitigate uh, the otherwise large expense that might be anticipated. Uh, Princeton University put an estimate out of a, a trillion dollars over the next uh, 10 plus years for distribution investment in the U.S. Uh, to deal with uh, many of the issues we, we just touched on and the fact that we've got a lot of aging infrastructure. Um, and so flexibility services and getting quite sophisticated, not just at the, at the bulk power system, but at the distribution level too. Uh, this is not unlike what um, I think you are looking at and certainly in the UK has been pursuing and other parts of Europe, um, but there's a lot of effort here as well. That's why having you know, a myriad of new entrants um, trying to understand and come into the market and participate and creating new markets for folks like General Motors or Ford or Toyota or Honda who wants to provide flexibility services off your electric vehicle uh, creates a kind of interesting dynamic. I touched on this uh, a moment ago, but, you know, we do have a lot of old uh, distribution networks in the U.S. Uh, that haven't been upgraded in some time. Uh, and we also, uh, because of because of the uh, severity of the weather events and increasing severity and number of, of severe events, we're really seeing um, reliability overall in the networks declining. Uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty dramatic in places like Michigan. It's gotten really bad. Um, and we've had the issues in California, obviously, with the wildfires. But uh, in, increasingly, this is, we're getting impacted from either hurricanes or uh, cyclones you know, coming up through the Gulf or the, uh, into the southeast or into Texas. Uh, we get these winter storms coming down through uh, from Canada, from the Arctic. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we're getting uh, flooding and the like off the, off the Pacific side uh, as well. So we're kind of getting hit from all kinds of directions. Uh, and, uh, you know, not unlike what we're seeing here and obviously in Auckland, we're having these really dramatic impacts and it's having a lot of effect on uh, electric system reliability that need to be addressed and considered. In summary, the kind of issues that we're seeing in the U.S. is um, pretty clearly what got us here isn't going to get us there. And, uh, and so we need to think about, you know, think differently about how we approach this. Um, what's becoming also clear is that the 2030 targets that we set out 10 years ago uh, or so uh, really are now uh, increasingly, as we get better visibility towards them, uh, are much larger than we thought in terms of scope and complexity. And we need to think about how we approach that. Um, we do need to instantiate uh, an integrated planning process that really links the resource transmission uh, or markets and resource transmission and, and distribution in the customer dimensions all together in a holistic approach. We also need to think about prioritizing activities. In the U.S., we've kind of all shot out of the cannon on our various silos and pursuing every track towards uh, you know, climate adaptation and climate mitigation without really a sense of, like, well, we can't, can we really all do this in, in the time that we've got? Uh, or should we be sitting back and you know, taking a Pareto approach and looking at the 20% that's going to get 80% of the, the impact and then and build on that as we go forward, uh, both for affordability for consumers, but also just effectiveness and being able to deliver. I think one of the things that's becoming clear in the U.S., I imagine here as well, is the supply chain issues coming out of the pandemic are really impacting the, the electric uh, network uh, business. Uh, in the U.S., we can't get a transformer for two years. It's a two-year backlog for a service transformer. Um, some of the oil that's used in the transformer comes from the Ukraine and Russia. So you can imagine uh, 
you know, uh, that's gone. Uh, and then we have a real labor shortage. We don't have skilled workforce to be able to support at the scale we're talking about. We're already struggling right now to deal with uh, qualified electrical workers and electricians and the like to support all this. Um, so this is also something that needs to be thought about. We obviously need to think differently about the consumer as a role in this system, uh, either as was mentioned yesterday, as passive consumer or as the prosumer that wants to get engaged and, and participate. Uh, but we need to think about what that role is, what are the expectations, uh, both for what the consumer expects to engage, uh, but also how do we need to think about engaging more effectively. Uh, we've kind of had the wild, wild west uh, in the US with some of these uh, flexibility services uh, at, the, at the consumer level. We had one battery provider that uh, was actually retaining 30% uh, option uh, on the battery use uh, without really the customer knowing in the contract. Uh, that's not acceptable, and we need to have some ways to think about a code of conduct. Uh, in the UK, they started an initiative amongst the industry folks called uh, FlexAsure uh, to, to kind of address these issues. That's at the large commercial industrial level. They're also pursuing something at the, at the residential small commercial called HomeFlex, uh, and we've been looking at that and studying that, and there's some work we've been doing for the U.S. Department of Energy to create a, a similar model uh, in the U.S. To, to propose and see if we can't uh, move that forward. Um, obviously, there's a need to think differently about the architecture of the grid um, because we're going to be using it quite different. Uh, we already have started, and you know the Tesla Edison architecture that we've been using for 140 years, it's been 140 years, if you can believe it, uh, it needs some change, it needs a refresh, it needs some new thinking about how we're gonna manage this with all the things that we're trying to, uh, to use the system for. And then we need to think about this institutional lag. Um, consumer innovation will continue to outpace our ability to go through our normal traditional institutional processes and we need to think about how we manage effectively through that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paul. That was amazing and fascinating and also cheery, cheery note to end on. Um, <laughs> I'm feeling optimistic. Um, we've only got a couple of time, uh, time for a couple of questions, but the, the one that I had that is also the most voted in the Slido app, yes, uh, is how do we actually anticipate the diversity of what consumer interests are going to be and what their desires are going to be in the future and reflect them across all planning cycles? Yeah, so the, uh, I mean, really good question. I mean, this is where changing how we think about those inputs into the planning process and, and engage consumers. The, the discussion yesterday I thought was really interesting in terms of how people are approaching this differently now. Occasionally in the past in the US, we might have a focus group here or there, or we might have a survey that went out, but frankly, they, they were at a level that really didn't touch on the kind of issues we're talking about here, sort of the behavioral interests you know, more the empathetic approach. Um, we didn't take like design thinking approaches to how, you know, understand where consumers' lives, kind of really deep, you know, what you would do in a consumer product development process. We haven't been using that. Uh, we kind of focused on customer satisfaction targets, but not really get too deep into how are customers' lives and the various types of customers and what means and how does that influence how we think about the system. So I think there's a move towards that now uh, and I was encouraged by yesterday's conversation and some of the reports I saw uh, talked about that, you know, hopefully we can start to introduce more of that. I know there are some utilities in the U.S., for example, Portland General Electric has hired people from Nike and elsewhere to, uh, to bring that sort of approach into their, uh, into their planning process. That's good news. I want shoes in the future too, so that's great. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'll, just while we're doing one last question, I'll get the panellists for the next session um, to come up and... Um, stand to the side of the stage or on the right-hand side of the stage, and I'll introduce you shortly. Um, and just one last question from uh, Jared at um, the Victorian Council of Social Service. You know, there are multiple research projects uh, and regulatory regimes on energy equity indicators, energy equity indicators in the USA. Any comment on their role or value in this kind of planning for the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a really um, big factor these days. Um, in, it's... We've thought about equity, but not as deeply as uh, I would say the last two years. So there's a lot of work going on right now um, in, in a number, of pretty much all the states and certainly from the federal level uh, about how do we factor that into the planning process, both uh, 
at the front end as we as inputs into the planning process for uh, planning objectives and criteria, but also on the back end as, as we think about evaluating the various investment op uh, options and solutions that that uh, that might be provided, and how does that uh, shape where which investments, uh, the priorities of the investments, and so on. So it's become quite uh, quite important. There's still much work to be done uh, to think about that. It's also a major factor in when we think about resilience planning. Uh, so that's one of the most important factors, actually, is in the resilience planning that feeds into it, is really understanding uh, disadvantaged and vulnerable communities and how we need to think about um, making sure that their, uh, their power security is, is maintained. If you ever need any advice on resilience, just ask um, a gay kid who grew up in regional Queensland in the 90s. <laughs> and give you some advice. Um, thank you so much yeah. for that, Paul. Please take a seat. And I'll introduce you to your next... Yes, give him a